a certain way of thinking and a certain flexibility, a certain perspective that then gets applied to all the other stuff that you're going to do anyway. If you think that you only have applied those skills and you can only apply them to playing the Beethoven Sonata, then you as a pianist are limiting yourself. But you're actually like completely formed on a physical level, on a mental level, on an emotional level. You're a completely, I would say, even optimally developed human being. Hi, and welcome to And If Love Remains. I'm your host, Mike Lovett, and I have with us today another great episode with Elias Axel Pedersen. Welcome to the show, Elias. Thanks for being on today. Hey, Mike. Thanks. So excited today. Great guest. Oh, I'm very excited. Yes, we have on the line, we're going to be talking to Frederick Chu. Uh, Frederick uh, performs, he's a he's a, a world why world renowned pianist um and teacher he performs at major venues on five continents lincoln center in new york kennedy center in washington uh the the chatelet in paris paris in buenos aires as well as touring extensively in smaller and unusual venues uh, he collaborates with classical music friends uh joshua bell uh, pierre Am- uh, amoye amoyal did i pronounce that right Moyal and uh, and the St. Lawrence String or- uh, Quartet, as well as non-classical friends like jazz pianist Bob James or storyteller David Gonzalez to bring vivid live piano experiences to all audiences. Welcome to the show, Frederick. Thank you for being on with, with Elias and I today. Oh, it's my great pleasure. Thank you. I look forward to this. Right on. Fabulous. Um, Let's let's talk. I I'm a big fan of origin stories. So let's, let's talk a little bit about your origin story and 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 you know I for most especially serious uh, pianists, um, piano becomes their life at a pretty early age. Um, was that the case for you? And 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 talk to me a little bit about about your passion for piano and how that grew. Well, I would say yes. Piano was definitely my life when I was growing up, but I wasn't thinking, oh, I'm going to be a musician. Uh, I started uh, music lessons kind of like a lot of young kids with, uh, you know, with parents who are very diligent They say, okay, you got to go to school, got to, got to do some sports, got to play piano, take some music lessons, go to scouts, things like that. So I, I started piano lessons age six with a local piano teacher. Uh, this was in Indianapolis uh, where I grew up. And uh, I think I was pretty good. You know, I don't remember, but people say, you know, I, I did everything in the lesson that I hardly practiced uh, <laughs> to get that done. So I, was, I think I was pretty talented. Yeah. Um, and pretty quickly, I switched to a college level teacher who was teaching at a, uh, uh, a city college in Indianapolis where my father taught physics and math and computer science. And uh, that was, you know, the beginning of the really serious stuff. He made me do scales and arpeggios and etudes and introduced me to all sorts of repertoire, Uh, made me wear cast iron bracelets to strengthen my my arms and and build (laughs) my ass. Old school. Uh, Yeah, well, you know, I I don't know if it's a school at all. It's not a school. I, I haven't heard or come across anybody else who's, worn cast iron bracelets these are like five pound cast iron pipe couplings oh, that, man. that my mother wrapped in my father's old socks to make them you know not rub on the skin and uh, i would do all my scales and and arpeggios and practicing with that and it was unusual uh it was linked to a relaxation technique that of course was totally essential because right. if you were wearing those weights and not relaxing, then you'd be like stiff as a board after a minute <laughs> right. and you get, uh, you know, carpal tunnel in, in a week. Right. Um, so I had that, I think, uh, fortunately, it worked for me. I had a great technique. I had a terrible sound uh, because I was wearing cast iron bracelets to play. And uh, when I went to college, it was pretty obvious. I went to Indiana University, which was just an hour south of where I was living. And I was good in, really good in music. I had won uh, some uh, 
I had won a number of local competitions and I'd already started studying with one of the university teachers, the head of the piano department, Karen Shaw. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, but I also said, you know, I, I want to do something else. So I also studied computer science and okay. yeah. So I got a separate degree in computer science at the same time as I was getting my music degree. And one of the things that really inspired me to do that was the author of a book that I had been obsessed with, Gödel Escher Bach, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Douglas Hofstadter, who's the author of that yeah. book. He, he had won the Pulitzer Prize for that book, and I had read it in high school twice. Oh, wow. Okay. And it turned out that he had just been hired by Indiana University that year that I started school. And I found out about it. He was asked <laughs> to do an intro to computer science, which was really just kind of like, let's pick Doug Hofstetter's mind and uh, see what he comes up with and uh, put him in a, in, a, in a classroom with a bunch of students and see what happens. So I was really lucky to be one of those students. And of course, he was my my icon at the time. And so that led me to a whole degree of computer science studying uh, programming, coding, now they call it, studying yeah. recursive thinking, uh, uh, hardware, all sorts of things. So that was that was really great. And I was doing music at the same time. Now, real quick question, because I love talking to people who, who are, have both a science and an art background. You know, and I think a lot of times um, people, um, you know, they associate math with music sometimes, and, and so, mm -hmm. or sometimes they think they're completely separate. Like you can't put those two things together. Yeah. Tell me about, about that, that kind of, um, mental relationship that you have between the sciences and, and art. Well, I think computer science, I've thought about this quite a bit. I think for me, it really complemented piano playing and vice versa in the sense that, um, you know, there's a whole artistic side of piano playing, but I wanted to put some order into that, which meant, you know, like taking a huge sonata that I had to learn, breaking it into the movements, breaking the movements into, into formal sections, breaking the sections into phrases, breaking the phrases into uh, lines or notes, yeah. and then figuring out how am I gonna play these notes so that I can put them back together to form a nice phrase. And then how am I going to put the phrases back together to form a nice section? And then how am I going to put sections back to put, to form a nice movement, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And back to the idea even of how am I going to put a number of sonatas or pieces together to create a nice program? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's uh, a macro scale. That architectural thinking, I think, is lacking yeah, in a lot of training. Yeah. And I think that, you know, I didn't really get too much of that in music. Uh, it was more about history and and you know, practicing. I was very much, you know, like practicing at the piano kind of person. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so that, of course, that whole structural thinking is inherent in computer science. You know, that's how you do it. You take a problem, you break it down into modules, and break the modules down into into operations, and they take that. I don't even know if the terminology is right anymore. Because my stuff from the eighties is totally obsolete now, you know. Like, right. uh, I was using programs that don't even, you know, don't even exist anymore. <laughs> but, but the thought uh, process is probably the same. Yeah, I think the thought process is the same. You break things down into small, smaller, smaller cells until you get to a thing that a compiler can compile, mm -hmm. and then you bring it back up and you test each stage of bringing it down and bringing it up until you get the final product to, to be working. Mm -hmm. And That's I fast. found that ap the application of that to music and then also the application of music to computer science where, you know, we had a class where we had to, uh, we were learning in Lisp, this language, which is really uh, popular in recursive uh, programming, self-referential programming. Uh, but at the time, it was kind okay. of theoretical, I believe. And so there was no compiler from Lisp. So our, our task as a class for the semester was to use Lisp to write a compiler for Lisp. Hmm. Wow. And that meant, you know, oh, okay. as a group kind of breaking down, what are the things that need to be done? And then every time 
we met for class, we compared like, how did you do this module? How did you do this module? And we looked at all the programming and it was really interesting to see how different people would tend to have different kinds of approaches to solving this problem. And in the end, there was this whole question of elegance yeah. and what is elegant programming? You know, is it using the least amount of characters? Is it using the least amount of functions? Is it using the least number of, of uh, uh, memory? Is it using, uh, is, it, is it structuring your language so that it actually creates kind of a shape? You know, that kind of artistic choice uh, was also in the mix. So it was really eye-opening for me Wow! That yeah. computer science actually had art and artistic choices behind it, and that was really important. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, well, I that's, love... and that's really interesting. We oh, to oh, go ahead, go ahead, Elias. No, no, you go. I, I was. I just had two quick points. One is I, I love that what you talked about as far as. Um, I, I, I talked to my kids, for example, about, you know, why, why do they, <laughs> why do they need to take algebra? You know? Uh-huh. And, uh, and one of the things I tell them is it's not, it's not like you're going to be using algebra per se or algebra two or whatever in your real life. You may, but you likely won't. But what it does is it allows your brain to think in a certain way and it trains mm-hmm. you how to, how to do these, these specific things. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, and then, the, as far as the the artistic the part of it, I, I love what you said there because I, I think about that with music, like how, um, even even with like notation, you know, a composer writes something, but but how it's notated so that it's clear, you know, what what does elegance mean, as you said, you know, yeah. it, how can it be clear to the performer so that the audience can it can be clear to the audience at the same time, you know, th- those are all interesting and artistic ways of thinking. Yeah. And, and very often, I'll, I'll, you know, when I'm organizing stuff with students or with my, with my wife, who I do a lot of projects with, we have a lot of work things that we work on in common. And, you know, like there's a lot of talk about, okay, we need to make a decision about this or who's going to, who's going to do this part of the job and who's going to do that part of the job. And very often it's, it comes down to something like, you know, like I can do this for you because it's just following an algorithm. And basically, it just needs to be done. But this other thing, that's an artistic choice. I can't make that artistic choice for you because it's artistic. And <laughs> we might be talking about like, right. like how do you want to arrange, uh, you know, the the folders in this filing cabinet? <laughs> you know? yeah. But there's this whole concept in in my mind about what is an algorithm and what is artistic. And there's both in everything that we do. And especially in the sciences, you have to look for that artistic stuff. And in the arts, you have to look for that algorithm oh. stuff to be able to really I I lost produce you guys. something great. Yeah, I love that idea. I mean, I, I think I'm sure you do this in your own teaching, too. And I know Mike does, um, is to introduce a lot of, uh, well, some music theory and talk about maybe the history of a piece just to say uh, how that fits into something. Or what What is the form? What is it based on? So people get sort of a more... Um, you know, real, real approach to what it is or what it's based on and what yeah. it looks like the architecture. Uh, but by the same token, I love hearing a great mathematician talk about the beauty of an equation. Um, yeah. You know, I forgot in math study, like what is the most beautiful equation? It has a few different variables in it, you know, I think the natural log. It's just like, well, what makes that beautiful? You know, what's the elegance of it? And I think some of that um, elegance uh is lost. Uh, I don't want to say on this generation, but it's just not a high consideration anymore in the sciences right. or or in the arts. The elegance right. of things. So, right. and I think that some of that comes from this sense of unlimited resources that uh, computers that, the, that computer science has brought to us. The idea that okay, we're just gonna put power behind yeah, this and make force. it happen. And we, and we have no need to be elegant or, or uh, concise, or efficient, or concise, simple. Yeah. Uh, we just put brute force behind it. Uh, and, uh, you know, like another meg, oh, another gig, another yeah. terabyte. Yeah. Okay, let's just put it in there and it'll happen. Yeah. And everything underneath it is so ugly. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody can understand it because there's no yeah. elegance yeah. to, to uh, unify everything. Yeah. I mean, I think we see that even in our daily interactions and in language, you know, our, our writings nowadays, I 
always think of my grandma. I know we're getting a little off topic, but just on the artistic side of doing something, she trained how to how to write, um, you know, like penmanship. They had penmanship mm-hmm. in school, and she yeah. had beautiful handwriting, and, and they used to make art from that. And now, you know, you read emails that are just so convoluted, and nobody's it's like nobody's tried to even write something that that's cohesive. I know, I know, totally. Anyway, it takes but it takes a lot of time and practice and, and art, <laughs> you know, and and Absolutely. science. So anyway, well, I, I think it it requires a kind of thinking. And this might also be kind of societal as well. We're going into a place, you know, a place where everybody has their specialty, and they do that, and and other people do the other stuff. <laughs> and uh, I think uh, you know, combining the arts and science—that's a very uh, common kind of you know thing, like STEM turning into STEAM kind of stuff. But uh, you know, I think everybody needs both. We need to be concerned about arts, not not like algebra is uh, we're going to do algebra. You know, exactly. It, it's arts because it teaches you a certain process and it teaches you a certain way of thinking and a certain flexibility, a certain perspective that then gets applied to all the other stuff that you're going to do anyway. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. It's holistic approach to sort of just life and thought in general. It's almost philosophical. That's why we brought you on <laughs> the program. I love yeah, it already. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, no, I, I was thinking, you know, when you were talking about algebra, it's, it, you know, piano study is kind of the same thing. I mean, you know, of all the right. piano students, I think there are, uh, you know, a certain percentage that will go on to actually be pianists in their life, mm-hmm. you know, teaching or, or playing or creating music or whatever it is. Um, but, you know, for the most part, I think the majority of people who study piano seriously are not going to be living their whole life playing the piano as their, as their career, mm-hmm. unfortunately. Right. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, a lot of people then say, what's the point? Of course, the point is that, uh, this is what I believe, the point is that by playing piano, by getting to a place where you are stepping on stage alone in front of an audience, no matter how big, and playing a Beethoven sonata from memory, you've done so much that will last uh, a lifetime in all the things that you're going to do, no matter what it is, Mm -hmm. no matter what career it is, you've developed skills that you can apply. If you think that you only have applied those skills, you can only apply them to playing the Beethoven sonata, then you as a pianist are limiting yourself, but yeah, you're actually yeah. like completely formed on a physical level, on a mental level, on an emotional level. You're a completely, mm-hmm. I would say, even optimally developed human being. Mm-hmm. There is no right. better training in all three of those areas. And I that, think a lot is, of my job is to open I, up I, the I, eyes I, of the students I teach. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That is really that I love what you're saying there, and 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 it, I, let me just add one other thing. I think I think that it it also um and, and you know becoming born again, if you will, becoming a new person, you know, going through that process. Um, all, it, the other thing it does is it is is it connects you to this, you know, three hundred year history um, mm, more, that yeah. you're now a part of that conversation. And, um, you're able to, you know, um, have this kind of common language that, you know, used to be a little bit more common than it is today, but, but that, and I think that's an important thing that, I mean, we ask, why do, why do we need to teach the arts? And one of the things that I think we're losing is as we get more, um, separated, we, we lose this common language of being Mm -hmm. able to, you know, talk about Beethoven talk, you know, and, um, and it, to me, I think that's a real shame of, of what, what pulls yeah. our society apart a little bit. Yeah, totally. And I think it's even, it's even greater than that. I mean, yes, Beethoven is amazing. Uh, iconic Bach is just like the universe. Uh, you know, Prokofiev, all these amazing characters that we know and we're lucky to know because we've studied it. But, you know, everybody who listens to pianos being played. Anybody who goes to a 
happens to be sitting in a piano concert or hears piano music on the radio suddenly come on and they know nothing about piano. There's something inherently, uh, inherent, it, it's very human to listen to the piano. And, and if, I, I'd be happy to, to explore that, what I mean by that. It, it's interesting because we often think of piano, you know, is it a string? Is it a percussion instrument? And we're always trying to imitate the voice as pianists and as teachers, yeah. we tell our students, you know, sing the line and all that. Uh, trying to emulate the most natural instrument. And actually, mm. I, I do love the piano. I think there are so many possibilities with it, uh, so many rich possibilities. And um, it is very hum humanistic. And yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, it's one of, you know, one of the great inventions, I think, of humanity is the keyboard. And it wasn't the piano, of course, at the time, organ and harpsichord, whatever. Mm -hmm. But the keyboard which is kind of like MIDI where it took something that was analog and you could produce any pitch and slide it up and down, you know, like any particular frequency you could just, it wasn't a note. It was just a frequency, mm -hmm. but the piano, the keyboard kind of divided it up into 12 or, you know, it happened to be 12. It could yeah. have been any other number happened to divide it into 12 uh, plateaus. And then we started calling them notes. And in some ways you would think, oh, that's just simplifying, you know, like dumbifying music and the riches of music. But in fact, in my opinion, it allowed for a very simple production of tones and the keyboard and the piano specifically allows for the production of more than one tone at a time. Mm -hmm. And when wow, you get yeah. to do that and each tone has its own pitch its own duration, its own uh, dynamic level, its own color, mm -hmm. uh, its own focus, and everything's independent. Then you start multitask thinking. You start multi-layered thinking, recursive thinking, and then you get all the richness of art. Um, mm -hmm. You can't, you know, not to denigrate any other instrument, but mm -hmm. there is no other instrument that can do what the piano does with that kind of independence of voice in real time operated by one person who is their sole agent uh, on a machine that doesn't move around, uh, you know, makes it very approachable by an audience. And you sit an audience in front of a piano and you get, a, some, get somebody who's trained and they start playing it and the pianist is multi-thinking, multi-layer thinking and the listener listening to the pianist begins to hear melody and then, oh, that's not a melody, that's an accompaniment. Mm -hmm. Oh, now there are two voices I'm hearing plus an accompaniment. Oh, and now maybe, is that three? Or there's a lot of stuff going on, you know? Like, just by listening to piano playing played well, you're, multi yeah. you're multitasking. Yeah. That... I love you. I love it. It's, it's almost like a, it's almost like a, a, a life hack, <laughs> you know, yeah. just by listening to the piano allows your brain to, to do some of those, those things. And I, I think that's really true. Yeah. And, and it's such an important skill that humans have, which is in my opinion, the counterpart to being able to collaborate with other people. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I like to think of it as all for one, one for all. The all for one, everybody contributes their their role, their job to a bigger whole. So an orchestra or a sports team or a corporation or a family or whatever the group might be. And you have a sp specified role and you do that and everything is great. And then the flip side is one for all, which is I am a pianist, me, Frederick Chu, but I am also a husband. I'm also a father. I'm also a friend. I'm also, uh, you know, a computer science nerd. I'm also I I can do lots of things. Yeah, I can be all of those things at the same time. Mm -hmm. And multi-layered thinking allows me to not go crazy thinking like, what am I? <laughs> you know, how am I supposed to answer this question if I don't know if I'm who am I? <laughs> you know, yeah. it's it's really it trains you. Yeah. In multitask thinking, it trains you to uh, to have multiple ideas in your head and come up with something that uh, that allows those multiple ideas to exist peacefully together. 
And yeah. that's what piano does. That That's ultimately what piano music, piano study, uh, piano playing, that's ultimately the societal benefit of it, is that you produce a whole bunch of multi-layered thinkers who are all able to hold multiple ideas in their head at the same time and not go crazy mm -hmm. and look for some kind of nice way to make them coexist I mean, you don't get partisan type people who have a single track mind when you have a bunch of pianists together. No. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. You get more, more than, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you get people who are, who are like, Oh, always debating this and that and lots of like different ideas. Oh, how about we try this? And how about we try that? Uh, you know, people who have like a lot of, I don't know, the perspective on things and, and willing. Now you have people who are singularly focused. Like I, really have a, a, a very strong focus on the music of Prokofiev. Mm -hmm. I was hoping to get I into don't, that. I don't define myself by that. I just have it. But I don't define myself by it. You, you, we could do a whole podcast, you know, three-hour podcast on Prokofiev. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, we might. And <laughs> and, 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 well, the other interesting thing is, is there are times in our lives when we have to, like, we talk about, you know, being balanced in life. Well, all of us as musicians know that there are times in our lives when we have to, like, have that singular focus where the only thing in the world that matters is preparing for a concert or the only sure. thing in the world is, you know, so, and, and I think that's the other thing it does is it, it allows us to prioritize um, because we're doing that multi-layered thinking that you're talking about that mm -hmm. we can go, wait a sec, what's the most important thing for me now to do? Yeah. Um, and, and that allows like us to become very skilled and then down the road with the dream of being balanced someday. <laughs> <clears throat> Yeah, and, and balance, you know, the idea of balance uh, very often means, oh, I need to pull back on this hmm. instead of let's up everything to the same level. You right. Know? And then yeah. deal with that. I think that comes yeah. with you know, that kind of confidence of let's up everything and deal with it when you're a multi layered person and you can handle lots of things. You know, that's, that's more like, okay, you know, it's more natural. I think a lot of our, our podcasts almost um, come down to, you know, why is, why is music great? What is it great for? It helps us become better people. It's almost a recurring theme in a lot of our, our musical mm -hmm. podcasts, which, which I love. And, um, you know, in a way, we're almost preaching to the, to the, to the choir sometimes. But I think even then, uh, just hearing this and, and reiterating it in different ways and delving into it, more deeply, I think it's, it's helpful for everybody to listen to. Um, and even for us, we, we realize that we're basically entrepreneurs, and I've brought this up in other podcasts, I don't really like that word, but uh, musicians, especially pianists, I feel have to do so much today to balance their lives and, and just to make a living and sure. not to be more of it about it, but it's almost uh, thankful that we can do all those things because none of them pays on its own so well. Right. Um, and we're almost forced into that, but we have the mindset to be capable of, of uh, balancing a life like that. And so, yeah, I, I, I do think I mean, it's maybe too biased or whatever. If everybody took music lessons and I would, I would say piano lessons, I think we'd have a better society and a more thoughtful and sympathetic oh, yeah. and empathetic society. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I think, you know, piano playing, if it was taught like math, mm -hmm. it would, bring so much peace to the world and so much uh, creativity and so much organization. I think it would, just, yeah. it would just be so good for communication and human society in general. Absolutely. Well, yeah. um, I, I wanted to ask you about, um, you, you mentioned it before, you mentioned before Prokofiev and, and, you know, a lot of our listeners may not even know kind of who that is. I'm sure many mm -hmm. will, but, but can you give us, and, and, and I would love to have you on again and maybe do maybe a more in-depth, you know, podcast about him, but, mm -hmm. but give us an overview, like who was he and, and why, what did you find in him, um, that was unique or, or what drew you to him and his work? Yeah, and your connection well, I, with him. You know, I knew Prokofiev's music before I was even aware of anything because my parents listened to it while I was still in the womb. <laughs> they, <laughs> they listened to music. They listened to classical music a lot. Uh, and I, I was born in the 60s, grew up in the 60s and 70s. And that was an era where the Soviet Union was kind of doing a kind of publicity and 
letting their greatest artists come out on tour and really impress people with their artistry. Uh, so, you know, these great pianists, uh, uh, Emil Gilel, and Stratislav Richter, and Lazar Berman, all these people who came out from the Soviet Union for tours and things and released recordings. And my parents were among the first to get those LPs and they played them over and over again. So I was, I was raised in that kind of an environment, listening to great violin and piano music by the Soviets. Okay. Uh, and Prokofiev was one of the main, well, maybe not one of the main, but certainly one of the uh, major composers that were played by them much more than by other people. Mm. And so I got like, uh, you know, a little bit uh, skewed view of what good music is. I heard a lot of Prokofiev. <laughs> That's and not bad. I don't know, for some reason, you know, everybody listens to Peter and the Wolf, right? Everybody yeah. knows right. that. Uh, a lot of people don't even realize that they know Prokofiev's music intimately because exactly. they know Peter and the Wolf. Yeah. Uh, I happen to also get exposed to the third concerto, the second concerto, uh, the eighth sonata, you know, just all sorts of crazy things. And for some reason, I just always felt an affinity for it. And when I started uh, studying music seriously, I was studying these great piano works and really enjoying them uh, and really feeling like I understood them, that the even that the piano technique that they required somehow fit my technique that I learned with the cast iron bracelets and everything. <laughs> Just to work well, like I would play Prokofiev's Toccata pretty easily, not that, not that it's an easy piece or that I didn't get tired, but, you know, like some people couldn't even play it right? because of their technique, uh, you know, not being able to do it. And, I, and my technique was kind of like naturally built for a Prokofiev Takata type piece. Mm -hmm. um, so fast forward a little bit to after my studies at Juilliard, uh, finished my master's, I was in my early 20s. And uh, one of the opportunities that came up was a chance to stay in Paris for a year at an artist residency. And I was not held back by anything else, so I took it. And I said, I'm going to learn French, I'm going to enjoy myself in Paris and practice a lot, and then we'll see what happens. And while I was there, I read a lot about Prokofiev. And, and Prokofiev, of course, uh, for people who know him, he, he spent quite a number of years in Paris. He lived in Paris for close to 15 years. Um, he was born in Russia before the uh -huh. Soviet Union. In the Ukraine area, right? In the Ukraine area. Yeah. And in the time of the Russian Revolution in 1918, he uh, left Russia through Japan and ended up in the U.S., toured a lot. And this was, you know, the big immigration uh, from, the, from the Russian Revolution. And he ended up spending a lot of time in Paris. Most of the 15 years that he was outside of, outside of uh, Russia, he spent it living in Paris. Um, and then after all of those years, he decided to go back to Russia, which was now the Soviet Union. And he had been tempted by uh, proposals from the government who wanted to have this big, uh, you know, very famous name back in the homeland and producing stuff sure. for the homeland. Um, and as soon as he got back, then everything started falling apart and, and World War II started, you know, fascism. And he was just caught up in Stalin and the whole thing. And it was one of the worst decisions in some ways, one of the worst decisions he ever made to go back. Uh, and he eventually died in the Soviet Union. Oh, wow. Uh, and uh, was, was lived a, a quite a distraught life uh, with a lot of... Uh, I would say uh, uh, not luxuries, but certainly he, he was, uh, you know, a little bit privileged a among artists, but, you know, artists got, they were, they had a big crackdown on artists. Right. And not Prokofiev necessarily had, a good thing. <laughs> yeah, Prokofiev had to present a letter to the Soviet Union of composers saying, I'm so sorry that I uh, put in atonal stuff in some of my works. I will never do that again. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Uh, 
you know, I, I will write for the people. I, I won't write this uh, kind of ambiguous tonalities uh, anymore. Uh, so, I, you know, as I studied this, I, I said, oh, Prokofiev lived in Paris. I'm going to look up uh, all the, the addresses where he lived. Uh, at the same time, I was like, oh, Chopin lived in Paris. Mm. Oh, Debussy, Ravel, <laughs> all, these, all these names that used to be just like names that I would reference but all of a sudden, I was like finding their buildings that they lived in. Right, you're the, there. The plaque, you know. I so said, I remember the very first plaque that really set me on this on this search was in a building where I had gone to borrow somebody's piano studio, a little teaching studio with an upright piano, and I was going to practice there because I didn't have a, I didn't have a piano. That's another story. Uh, I didn't have a piano. I went there and I see this plaque on the side of the entrance that says Chopin lived here from 1833 to 1836. <laughs> wow. And wow. I was 24 at the time. Chopin lived there from 23 to 26 years old. I was oh. like, wow. Whoa. Chopin was a real person. He saw this building every day. He saw these cobblestone streets that I'm seeing right now. At the same age. And I'm going to go up the stairways, maybe to, to, you know, in the same building as him. All of a sudden, I felt a kinship to Chopin, yeah, as a real person, and that was something that maybe I was primed for. My parents named me after Chopin mm-hmm. with the French spelling of the name without the K. Yeah, uh, they loved the music of Chopin. Yeah, they didn't expect me to become a pianist, but certainly they named me after after a pianist. Right, and here was this pianist, you know, mm-hmm. like his legacy living in this building at the same age I was. And I, all of a sudden I could really commiserate with Chopin as a person. You know, that's really interesting. And, and especially coming from um, the States that doesn't have, you know, the European history um, mm-hmm. that must have been like, like when we, when, when it's almost, we, we think of Beethoven or Chopin or Bach. I mean, they're, they're so abstract. Like I can't even imagine the house that they live in. You know, it's, it's mm-hmm. just, it, you know, I live, I live in a house that's very, very old and it was built in 1976, you know, here in Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's and old so, in Arizona. Yeah. Right. And so, so to imagine a, you know, Frederick Chopin living in this house, you know, years. almost 200 years ago, it, that, that's the, I mean, for I can imagine, you know, somebody who who looked up to that that just would have been a mind blower. It would yeah. have been for me. Yeah, and and all of a sudden, the fact that Chopin was a real person meant, oh, he did human things. He he right. Wrote, he had to make a living. He wrote music. Oh, he wrote this. It's dedicated to princes, whatever. Like oh, so that was a student of his. Oh, okay. So he taught lessons. He did this. He did. You know, all of a sudden, everything started to come started yeah. coming to life. And the act of piano playing came to life and the act of listening to piano came, you know, it's just everything just, it was a spark that really started the whole thing. I, I looked for Prokofiev's places and, and his music suddenly came to life as well. And uh, coincidentally, uh, Prokofiev's widow lived in Paris and had been living in Paris since she escaped the Soviet Union after being in the Gulag. Oh, wow. And uh, she was with her uh, oldest of two sons, uh, also named Sergei. Uh, and they were they had settled in Paris. The other, the younger brother, had settled in London. And I kind of knew this, and I was kind of like, "Oh wow, you know, that would be so cool <laughs> to, to meet them." And then I played a concert in the Salle Corteau, which is one of my absolute favorite halls to play in. And this was a, a place that I had a long association with. I, I played, you know, I played like three or four concerts in that hall every year for 10 years, 12 years. Wow. And one of them was a kind of a trial run of one of my Prokofiev recordings with some obscure music and you know, stuff that I just needed to try out in concert before recording. And after I finished the program, which was really exhausting, I was backstage and I was just huffing and puffing. And through the door comes this gentleman and sticks out his hand and says, hello, I'm Oleg Prokofiev. So nice to hear your concert. I was like, oh my God, I know all about you. (laughs) You're an actual real person here. Uh, Wow. uh, Yeah. And it turned out that he had been brought to my concert 
by a friend of a friend. And I had no idea that they had that, that this friend of a friend, I didn't know him. I didn't know he knew Prokofiev. It turned out that he was a, a longtime friend of, of Oleg's. And Oleg happened to be in town and he got dragged to this Prokofiev concert that he didn't want to go to. <laughs> kind of like, I don't want to hear my dad's music again. You know? <laughs> but uh, he came and then he was, he was really impressed and we hit it off. And, and I went to London to visit him a number of times, met his family, met his, uh, his uh, son, who was a young teenager at the time, uh, Gabriel, who is, who is now a very celebrated composer of of classical and techno music yeah and uh, i met uh, through them the other son uh, sergey who looks i think exactly like how sergey prokofiev the the <laughs> grandfather uh, must have looked or the, the the father must have looked uh no the grandfather the he grandfather, was the, yeah. the son of the the, the oldest son uh, sviatoslav uh, prokofiev so, you know, I, I got to know the whole family. So talk about like, wow, bringing something to life. That was like, you know, for me, I asked them questions about their dad. You know, <laughs> like, what did your dad do when he had a concert? You know, like, how did he handle this? How did he do this and that? You know, it was really a remarkable opportunity for me to just be in the music as, you know, as part of like a, a life as opposed to a study, right? Know, something, something to research, and that was incredible. I must say, is it, it was it's just amazing to uh, be in you know direct contact with those the, the descendants, and like you say, these people are who are icons or just these fictitious people. They come they come to life. It's like oh, they were human beings too. They had to go grocery shopping here when they lived, yeah, up, right. you know, and they they walked on these cobblestones up these stairs and. And Prokofiev, I was saying, was quite a pianist himself and in a way wrote via, very pianistically uh, for the, I know your technique, you said, sort of meshed very well with his music. But uh, yeah, he, he knew how to get around the keyboard. So to be able to ask his family members, how'd your dad play this or how'd your grandpa play, play this? Yeah. It must have been just incredibly eye opening. And, and even if it just made you kind of reflect a little bit more on the pieces that you were playing, I'm sure it changed some of your in interpretation. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, I was in the process when I, when I met Oleg, I was in the process of recording the complete Prokofiev works. And there were quite a number of pieces that I had not even been, been aware of uh, when we started like re researching and kind of figuring out which is going to go on which out, which volume. And like, I'm uncovering these pieces. And I'm like, wow. And a lot of those uh, more obscure pieces were from his Paris period. So this was really, it really, brought a great insight into Prokofiev, the person. Mm -hmm. And that led me to really understand, like, you know, you hear these histories about, oh, Beethoven was here when he wrote this piece, or he was, like, going deaf. You know, like, I could really empathize with Prokofiev. He was modern enough, and yet classical enough, you know, except yeah. the standard repertoire. But he was, he was right at that that's sweet crushed. spot for me, like I could really empathize with him and still have reverence for his work. Mm -hmm. That's and a great balance. That, that is a sweet that, spot. Yeah, part, part of that reverence was, you know, the idea that he left the Soviet Union at age, uh, he would have been 27. Uh, and then he lived in Paris for 15 years and then he went back to the Soviet Union when he was uh, 42. Well, as it turned out, I didn't know it at the time, but it kind of played out. I was born in the US, raised in the US. I left the United States when I was 24. I lived in Paris for 12 years, and I came back to the US when I was 36. And, and now I'm still even finding parallels. Like he came wow. back and all of a sudden Stalin kind of shut the borders and then the war started and everything was uh, rationed and everything was bad. Now, I'm not saying I lived anything similar to that, but as soon as I came back in year 2000, uh, you know, like within a few months, 9 11 happened. Yeah. Yep. The stock market dot com crash, uh, 2008 crash, and, and, you know, and all the wars and, you know, just all the things. It's, you know, and then pandemic. Uh, you know, it's, it's, 
That's uh, it's it, not that it's an exact match, but somehow you feel I a kinship. Can, yeah, I can relate to him, and in doing so, I can really think, you know, wow, this music says something about his life much more than oh, he wrote it in this period, so it's this kind of style. Mm-hmm. It's like literally, like what was he thinking when he wrote this? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It gave me incredible insight, for example, into the the three the, the masterpiece uh, for piano by Prokofiev, the three war sonatas, mm-hmm. number six, seven, eight. Yeah. Uh, this he these he wrote in the year nineteen thirty nine to nineteen forty four, uh, the height of the war, and people call them the war sonatas because you know they think ooh it depicts war stuff. I have a totally different theory from having thought about like what he was going through he was also writing his music he was writing his uh written autobiography okay like, recalling his life because he was in he was being sequestered like he was like you know not able to do stuff not able to go out and he had all this free time kind of like all of us in the pandemic yeah and you know so he starts reflecting on his life he's, he's starting to get into his 50s and he's like you know, reflecting on his life like I just have been doing in my 50s. <laughs> and kind of like, what's my life story? And he's writing it down. At the same time, he's composing this 10 movement super sonata, which he later then split into three separate sonatas. But they are number six, seven, and eight. Mm-hmm. And when you look at the movements that he laid out at the very beginning, he laid out the, the, the 10 movements. They tell his life story. Oh, wow. They a- absolutely tell his life story, and they use the style of his music of the time to tell that story. Mm. That's great. Interesting. So the, the first movement of the Sixth yeah, Sonata is this. It's like rocks hitting metal. Yeah. And that's that was how he created his reputation, playing these uh, brittle percussive uh, piano works that he would write for himself when he was 10 years old. Well, the, the Takata, so, the yeah. Diabolic Suggestions, the Sarkam, you know, that was his, how he built his reputation by playing percussive piano. Nobody had done that up until that, until him. So he uses the percussive technique. You know, he's at a stage in his, in his forties now where he's not like writing percussive piano music anymore. Right. He's, he's evolved. Wow. Almost out of nowhere, this this comes out at the sonata. Obviously, there's a there's a purpose for it, and I yeah, love he's he's the using this style that he developed. He's bringing it back out to tell his story from that period. Wow, I like it. And then the seventh sonata, the first movement of that is this kind of weird, like almost atonal. Yeah. It's almost like a tone row uh, in in uh, in serial music, mm-hmm. and it's about as atonal as as Prokofiev got. And this was representing his Paris period where he was constantly feeling like, oh, I got to compete with Stravinsky. Oh, I got to compete with, with Mio. I got to compete with Poulenc. I got to compete with all of these people who's, who are being Push, really uh, academic and, and abstract and inventive, always inventing new styles. I have to be the one to invent the next new style. And he's like using the seventh and this atonal thing. That was what he had to renounce at the, at the Congress. Uh, but you know, it's as close as he got, and that was to represent. It wasn't his style at the time. It was to represent that kind of search for the next new that he felt he was forced to do by staying in Paris, and that eventually led him to give up on that and say, "Oh, I can't deal with this rat race anymore. I'm going to just go back to the Soviet Union. They're offering me free food, free lodging, free you know." Uh, acclaim and free uh, premieres of this and that. I'm going to go back and I'm going to write music for the people. I'm going to, I'm going to embrace my romantic melodic side and work on ballets and operas. It's going to be great. And that's the eighth sonata. The first movement of the eighth sonata is just this beautiful, long romance. It's like one long breath that just develops over 15 minutes. And that represented his, like, ah, oh, I'm coming home. But there's a dark side to it. And eventually it gets to this kind of really rigorous, 
like, oh, everybody's running around because the war is starting and, and we have to we have to shut down. Right. A brooding kind and of. He tells the story up until that time. And then a few years later, he writes the Ninth Sonata, which hmm. I like to include in the War Sonatas because it tells the final chapter, which is he's like so emaciated intellectually and culturally. He writes this thin kind of thing that kind of re- repeats on itself. It's a sonata where the first movement ends and the second movement starts with the material of the last movement. And then the uh-huh. third movement starts with the material of the second. And the fourth starts with the end of the third. And then the end of the fourth is the beginning of the first movement. So it kind of like it's beats its own tail. And it's just, it's just it's self-defining, like little protective thing. It's very thin texture. And that, for me, is like the final chapter of Prokofiev telling his story. Yeah, almost nobody plays the Ninth Sonata, especially because six, seven, you know, seven's played all the time. I, I happen to love eight, maybe more. Um, yeah. But everybody plays those, and and uh, I love your sort of narrative through them and what they represent. And I, I'm hoping listeners will will now listen to those sonatas. And, and some are a little bit like the seventh's a little bit out there for some people, but yeah, uh, it's worth exactly. it. Yeah, totally. I, I think, especially if you play the first movements of six, seven, eight, nine, and just think about the evolution of that, it's going to be, you know, it's, that's kind of like reading his autobiography, but just yeah. listening to it in music. Yeah. yeah that's a, that's great. That's awesome. In, in fact, I was going to ask you and, and, and obviously you definitely, you know, put these kind of, you know, in a special category, but I was going to ask you for, for those who, who maybe aren't as, um, um, you know, they, they don't know his work quite as well. What, what, um, I guess maybe two things, what, other than Peter and the Wolf, <laughs> what would be, what would you recommend that people listen to and, 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 uh, to get a taste of Prokofiev? And then the second thing is what's maybe a deep cut for those guys who, who know it and, and would like to hear something, you know, interesting and, 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 uh, um, yeah. Well, I think, you know, there are quite a few things uh, that Prokofiev wrote that are, that's music for the people. And he really successfully did write music for the people. I would say the Lieutenant KJ Suite is a real easy on-ramp. Uh, anything from Romeo and Juliet, the ballet, is a, is so compelling. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. one, one of the projects yeah. that I'm involved in now is uh, I've, I've produced my own uh, ballet uh, version of Romeo and Juliet with you know dancers, a troupe of dancers, and only piano, not orchestra, playing the music. Mm. Wow! Using Prokofiev's original piano score that he composed, that he orchestrated from, but which is never performed because it was never meant for performance. And I've made a, a playable arrangement of it, and we stage it with dancers dancing around the piano that. Uh, gets the audience up out of their seat and dancing the court scenes. Wow. And it has the only place that has Prokofiev's original idea, which was that Romeo and Juliet don't die at the end. Oh, wow. When are you going to perform that in Arizona? I'll, I'll go. <laughs> right. Uh, I, I, I did the premiere in Philadelphia. I have uh, kind of follow up performances uh, in the spring in uh, Connecticut, but it's something I'm really. Uh, Oh, another thing. So because this version has the happy ending and it, it was never orchestrated, uh, we can offer in the piano version a choice. And I call my production, Romeo and Juliet, the choice. We offer the audience a choice. Thumbs up, thumbs down. Mm-hmm. Do we do the happy ending or we do the, the tragic ending? How brilliant is that? Post during the intermission by a text and the answer we as musicians and performers we see what the poll result is so we go out on stage knowing which ending we're going to do but they we don't, don't tell the audience. yeah oh that's awesome and so when the moment comes when it's like life or death for for juliet they're like they're on the edge of their seats <laughs> oh, great. how great oh, that is i love that have no way to that know, is like, wonderful i mean talk about keeping yeah. people engaged yeah. Yeah. So this old story oh. suddenly becomes relevant. Hey, like, by the way, uh, go ahead, Mike. <laughs> right. Well, I, I mean, I have to know. Like, is it? Do you have like a, a feel like a? 
I, you've only performed it. I, well, I'm just curious. What do you think the audiences are going to choose more often? <laughs> well, I'm, fortunately, you know, in, in Philadelphia, we had three performances. Oh, okay, okay, we, okay. We could kind of predict the results. As it turns out, the first performance, they picked the the un, never performed before uh, happy ending. Okay. Uh, because that it had never been heard before. Yeah. So obviously people there were curious about that. Yeah. The second night, we were a little bit like wondering, oh, what's going to happen? But they, they picked the same ending, the, the happy ending. And then the third night, everybody who had been to one of the first two performances now felt like, oh, I want to see the other one. And there, was enough, there was enough of a majority that they, they picked the tragic ending. That's amazing. Oh, that's bringing. So even yeah, though we could have predicted that, it was still like you couldn't know in the moment like exactly that was going to happen. So yeah. it was. It was like everybody was just on on the edge of their seats, like watching what was going to happen. And it was oh, fun. Like, talk about bringing what music like that into the 21st century. I mean, I yeah, participatory. Like you decide. You know, <laughs> choose your yeah, own and adventure. Part, yeah, it's like choose your own adventure, but with something. I mean, I've <laughs> been part of a a John Cage performance where the audience becomes part of the performance in a way, but it's nothing, you know, of the sort, it's going to be different every time. No, no nothing that's relatable that any themes you're going to remember, but this is something that kind of people know. Um, yeah. And then, and then um, you said that at some point the audience gets up and is part of the dance. Yeah. Because it's more intimate because the piano is a much more intimate inviting instrument you can place it anywhere and people can sit around it so we staged it in the round uh so that the people who are dancing were just people that you know they would come next to you and you could see them dance it was much more of a visceral kind of thing we wanted to you know really bring this to life because they were going to decide juliet and romeo and juliet you know what's their fate they needed to decide real people's fate mm -hmm. Yeah. So we had the dancers dancing in and out of the audience seats. And then at one point we said, you know, there are some court scenes where the music is pretty regular and let's have the audience members, you know, who want to, they can get up and just imitate the dancers and follow the pattern. Yeah. You know, it's like kind of like square dancing. You, you just follow the instructions. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. And so we had three numbers where certain members of the audience got up out of their seats and just kind of, got in line and did the court dance that the dancers were doing. They were very simple and they were demonstrating very, very easily, you know, copied moves. Yeah. And it just made everything even more like, this is relevant. Mm -hmm. Like this is really happening to real people mm -hmm. right now. So, and uh, wow. so the whole package was just a, a rethinking of what is dance. And all of that came from having discovered this piano version of the of the ballet and I, I had discovered this version you know many many years ago and i just played it for myself over and over again just out of just sheer pleasure of being able to play all that music well, so I, I have uh, a couple of questions yeah. on that first of all it's great you're bringing you're even bringing broadway kind of into that and i'm thinking of when the lion king you know hit and and people were dancing in aisles and just like it's a new thing what you can break that that fourth wall um yeah and you're doing that with with a centuries old form of ballet and piano music. Um, yeah. But I'm curious when, when you said the, the audience members maybe got up to dance and, and copied this out. First of all, did you play this by memory? Did you have the score and did you have to pause to explain a bit? Was there sort of intermittent music going on that could just be repeated while the audience members were being trained? Like what are some of the logistics be behind putting a project like oh, that? No, it was, well, the dancers in the lobby before the concert started, they would pick out, they, they would go around and kind of poll the audience informally and say, would you be willing to participate in this? They have a chance to explain kind of what okay. was going to happen. Okay. Uh, and then they had, they knew where they were seated. And so this dancer would go to that person that they had already talked to earlier. Okay. Uh, wow. And then just hold out the hand, the person would get up and they would just kind of be led it's just simple, you know, like curtsies yeah. and then a, a spin and then a this and that. And you walk over here, you know, it's a pretty simple gesture. So the music was just the music. Yeah. Okay. It was just, uh, you know, part of the court dance and it really made it into like, okay, this is, 
what happens at the court dance. Yeah. Like all the couples get introduced yeah. and then they interact with each other. Yeah. So it was really cool. That's Super an, cool. what a great production. I mean, it's a whole production, not just a piano recital, you know, or a ballet. Yeah, and this was, this was a dream project for me. Like I had been thinking about this for 20 some years. And then finally I got a choreographer and a grant to, to produce it. And it was just a dream come true. It was so such a thrill mm -hmm. to do this program and, to, and to, to play it. I'm in the process now of, of actually recording the, the whole ballet uh, for Centaur Records. Oh, great. I'm doing it piece by piece. And this production that we're doing in, in April is going to be kind of like the, the deadline for getting all that out. Okay. What, will it have the, the happy ending in, in that recording? Yes, it will have that. <laughs> It'll have both. It'll okay. have both. Because both <laughs> exist in the piano. And I don't know if there's a way... To, for people, I, I guess there must be some way where you can click, 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 <laughs> yeah. click, and then click the way to the, yeah. the the ending that you want. That would have to be uh, figured out, I think. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's I great. Love that. Wow. Well, um, so we've been talking to Frederick Chu, and and uh, he's a classical pianist, amazing performer, uh, producer. I mean, this guy is is a teacher. He's an amazing guy, philosopher. I think we can now call him. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Computer but programmer, I'll, I'll, <laughs> computer programmer, just you know, Renaissance man. Yeah, uh, Frederick, thank you so much for for being on the show. Um, I, I hope you'll you'll kind of send to have be on here again. We we really enjoyed it, and there's so much oh, to talk I about. I, I would love to come back. Thank you guys for having this oh, and for for allowing the conversation to go in all these great places. It's it's great to have a chance to talk about that. Yeah, fantastic. Um, I'll put uh, uh, Frederick's uh, uh, website in the show notes, but you can go to www.frederick with no K to C H I U dot com. Um, and then also, um, he also has a Patreon that that um, uh, you get some goodies and, and get some inside info. Um, wh where do people find that Patreon, Frederick? Patreon, well, if they go to frederick2.com, there's a link on the front page to it. It's okay. one of the current projects, and they can get uh, recordings from my my private vault stuff that's studio recorded that hasn't been released. They get access to uh, inside tips and uh, zoom calls every month and every, all sorts of things. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, thanks again for being on the show. Um, any, anything, any last uh, questions, Elias or Frederick, do you have any last thoughts you'd like to? Oh, I think this has just been eye opening, and, and I just love you're such a great storyteller. It's another thing to add to the resume. It's just wonderful to hear all this and connect with you. Uh, having followed your career and seeing you do so many things, um, it's just, it's really inspiring because it gets my brain firing up for things too. So I'm sure I'll pick your brain another time. Okay, yeah. wonderful. Well, see, we're all we're, we're all musicians. We're all multitask thinkers. You know, multi layer right. thinkers. Right. <laughs> it makes for an interesting interaction. Yeah. And I'm definitely, I'm definitely putting multi-layered thinker into my lexicon now. Yeah. Tonight. Good. <laughs> that, Excellent. Excellent. So you've been listening. This is uh, Mike Levitt. We've had Elias Axel Pedersen and our guest, special guest has been Frederick Chu. And you've been listening to And If Love Remains. <laughs> <laughs>